do you think of the time just how dead boring straight it is? No. You just do it. You just do it, yeah. Because it's a job. Yeah, it's true. Well, everyone's going to do something different, don't they? It's a pretty good job, though. And this is basically the only length of the track you do, the straightest piece of railway in the world, isn't it? Yeah, we go from uh, Calgary to Cook and back again. So it's a job, but a monotonous job. Apart from driver changes, the main relief from the monotony up front comes from speed changes, crossing points. The speed limit is then 70 kilometres an hour, so a driver's lock is a series of braking and accelerating. Apart from that, they have to keep an eye out for stock which wanders onto the track. It's an area where they measure acres to the cattle and where it rains once or maybe twice a year. I wish to go on forever. You're not going to get bored out there. Fantastic out here. Fantastic. And look, you look out there. And it's, look, it's just like being on the sea. Beautiful. They call it the Nullarbor Plains out of this world. Out of this world. Fantastic. Really bored to tears. Oh, what is the sea? Nothing. Just isolation. <laughs> My car's on the back of the track. I sit here, relax, and enjoy it. Oh, I have done it ten times. You know, I don't have to. I can fly, but I prefer the train. Pleasant, nice, nice company. Yeah. No, I'm not bored. I don't get bored. I just enjoy it. And I will admit, you look out the window, it's the same thing all the time, but even that's different. Sydney is still 2,500 kilometres away, but for the passengers, there's the inevitability that they will get there without much trouble, now that it's standard gauge all the way. But it wasn't always so easy. First, there would have been a change from 3 foot 6 inch gauge to standard at Kalgoorlie. Then another change at Port Pirie, back to 3 feet 6. That went to Broken Hill, where the line reverted to standard gauge for the leg into Sydney. That was after 1917. Until then, the only link was a painfully slow overland trip or by sea. Believe it or not, the gauge problem in Australia has been the result of a classic Englishman, Irishman and Scotsman joke. It was a joke which almost turned very sour during the war. Just turn back to 42. Remember? The Englishman was the Secretary for Colonies who wanted standard gauge. The Irishman was a New South Wales engineer who persuaded that government to adopt the broad Irish gauge. They did, and other states followed suit. Then came the Scotsman to replace him, and back went New South Wales to standard gauge. But South Australia and Victoria were already committed to the Irish gauge, and an impasse was reached. By the time the Second World War ended, it was a huge issue. Look at the map. The Japs did. They saw the broken gauge between the states and laughed, laughed at the hopeless bottlenecks. Laughed at the line shrunk to three feet six in the west, but suddenly stopped and changed the four feet eight and a half to cross the Nullarbor. And then stopped again and spread out wider to five feet three across Victoria. And stopped again and changed back to the stand in New South Wales, four feet eight and a half. Then up to Queensland and change again, back to three feet six, six different gauges. A hundred different engines, a thousand different trucks. All be all changed! Oh, Wake the children. Grab the luggage. Find the ticket. Get a porter. We're changing trains. We're changing gauge. This is the border. This is the all barrier changed. between the states. They won't be in your purse. I always keep them in this pocket. Try looking in your overcoat. They won't be in my overcoat. I always keep them in this pocket. I want things to change. But we can't do it. Why? Because we have to change into another one. Why? Because this is as far as this one goes. Why? Because, oh, because it wants to rest. I don't know. Come on. Look in the other suitcase. No, they won't be in the suitcase. I always keep them in this pocket. A thousand passengers every day. 
4,000 tons of freight every week. Men, women, children, babies, papers, parcels, pears, potatoes, plows, tractors, cultivators, turkeys, ducks, onions, apples, fowls, chicken, sheep and cattle, bulls, cows, iron, steel, timber, coal and surf. Changing carriages, changing trucks, wasting manpower, wasting time. The rails of the clown in this circus ring, tumbling, juggling, dropping the freight, but we're not laughing. Look ahead, break down the barriers, throw a single line of steel about Australia, climbing Barclay Table Land, joining Darwin to the south. Push up the horizon, reach out to the lonely men who fight the endless distance of the inland. Long droves like that cost... One of the big hopes for standard gauge around Australia was to give the primary producer some hope of providing an escape route for starving stock in times of drought. In 26, a drought came down on the midwest of Queensland and took four and a half million of them. Perished. Buried in dust and sand. Four and a half million of them. That's a lot of sheep. But it's not only cattle and sheep. What about the grower in the west? If we had a direct rail, western Australia could become the California of Australia. Instead of having to pick our fruit and vegetables half green the way we do now, we could pick them ripe at their best and rail them to the east in refrigerated cars on fast trains. They could cross Australia from Perth to Sydney in about four and a half days. Today, Australian railways carry a yearly load of 525 million passengers and 39 million tons of freight. Essential to Australia's defence program is coordination of railways. It was a glaring fact that had been pointed out to the federal government as early as 1910, when Lord Kitchener came to Australia. His report on military defence proclaimed that railway communication had resulted in lines which appeared to be more favourable to an enemy invading Australia rather than defence of the country. Broken by six different gauges, Australian railways only gave the war a fraction of its great potential. Munitions, machines, soldiers, civilians jammed the break of gauge points. Hopeless bottlenecks with only one solution. Standardise. Standardise we did, well at least to the degree that Brisbane is now connected to Perth. That finally happened in 1970, eight years after Melbourne was linked by standard gauge to Sydney and 40 years after Sydney was linked to Brisbane by the same gauge. Of course, there's nothing magical about standard gauge four feet eight and a half inches or fourteen hundred and thirty five millimeters nothing especially dynamic about the engineering at that width which makes it more suited for railway tracks than any other so where do we stand today victoria laid more broad gauge than anywhere in the world even more than the irish themselves both victoria and south australia are still predominantly broad gauge which means the overland the train between melbourne and adelaide operates on that gauge South Australia also clings to some narrow gauge. Not to be outdone, Queensland and Western Australia are rationalising their economic narrow gauge. In the Sunshine State, they see it as the future, while in Western Australia, they've been aiming for the best of both worlds with dual gauge to run both standard and narrow gauge trains on the same routes. New South Wales remains the home of standard gauge in Australia, which it shares with the main national rail routes. Clear the forests, fell the ironbarks, haul the timber, cut the 12 million wooden sleepers. And standardise. Somewhere in the Nullarbor Plain, the Indian Pacific will have to wait more than once for a goods train to pass. This taste of priorities is explained by the railway's saying anything that breathes isn't worth carrying. So here, the Indian Pacific, for years the flagship of the Australian rail fleet, is subservient to a freight train. However, the freight train pays for itself. The Indian Pacific is losing millions of dollars a year. So suggestions have come thick and fast. Give it to private enterprise. Speed it up. Put a casino on it. Slow it down. Make it more of a tourist train. Cut back the bureaucracy. 
the last suggestion has a familiar ring. Bureaucracy at all levels seems to have had a special interest in the various Australian railways. 